All right, let's uh, pray and then we will get started. Father, we thank you once again for a new day in our lives. Thank you for the opportunity to get together, study, learn, be equipped. And we pray, God, that things we discuss, the things we study today, uh, will equip us, will fill us, God, with your wisdom, with your understanding, uh, that we'll be able to uh, share the new good news of Jesus with people, that we'll be able to impact many lives for your kingdom. We thank you, we honor you, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay. All right, so yesterday we talked about the resurrection of Jesus. Um, how by just by looking at the biblical accounts, you know, we can, even though it happened 2,000 years ago, we were not there physically to see it. But going by the biblical accounts and examining it, we can be sure that it is a factual incident rather than a made-up story, right? It was not something somebody just made up and uh, put together and tried to get others to believe it. If it was something like that, it would have fallen apart and uh, even the disciples of Jesus would not have, you know, been able to stand up and support such, uh, such a thing. But just by looking at how things happen, all the people that were involved, what happened after that, even to the conversion of the Apostle Paul, or at that time Saul, we can say very conclusively the resurrection of Jesus is a fact. It's not just a story. It's not a myth. It's not uh, a hoax. So today we want to... Uh, talk about two things. We want to talk about how to share Christ with a, with a Hindu and then how to share Christ with a Muslim. All right. So lesson number 13 and 14. So that's our goal today. Uh, we'll try to cover these two. Right. So we just want to understand in both cases, first of all, in, with the, how to share Christ with a Hindu. We want to understand a little bit of the difference between the Christian faith and the Hindu belief, right? What is the difference? Some basic things. We're not going into great detail, but we want to understand enough so that when we speak, uh, we make sure that they are understanding it correctly. Because when we say something, they may understand it differently, right? So we need to be careful. So let's understand. So when we talk about God, the Bible talks about one God, triune God, God in three persons. And the God of the Bible says, I am God, there is no one else. Very, very strong. I am God, there is no one else. In fact, one of the commandments is, you will not make any image of anything. Very clear. Whereas in Hinduism, there are so many gods and goddesses. So, I don't, I don't know, they say like 300 or 330 million gods, goddesses. Like almost every place in India you go, there'll be some other, you know, god and goddess being worshipped. But it is all under Hinduism. So, that's a big difference. Man, about man... Man is sinful. Man was created in the image of God, but man is sinful. He has sinned. Right? You know, in uh, Hinduism, say he's a part of God, Brahma, and uh, sin or sin is only considered in terms of good deeds and bad deeds. You know, oh, yeah, okay, you did a bad deed, fine, you do a good deed or you did more good deeds, it will uh, account for the bad deeds. But when we talk about sin in the Bible, it is even more serious because it separates us from God. It is going to send us to an eternal place called hell. 
Uh, so it's not just about, okay, you did a bad deed, you can compensate it for by doing many other good deeds. Sin in the Bible has very serious consequences. Scripture, we have the Bible, the, we believe it's inspired word of God, word of God. Uh, Hinduism, they have several scriptures. You have the Vedas, you have the Bhagavad Gita, the Ramayana, Mahabharata. A lot, lot of scriptures are there which they consider. Uh, but it has been handed down, you know, through verbal and then later on through text. It's been handed down over time. Jesus Christ uh, is God who became man and he's God's only provision for salvation. Now, how do Hindus? respond to Jesus. In many cases, they say, okay, he's one of the other gods. You know, they will accept. Of course, right now in India, especially there's a lot of, uh, generally there's a lot of hostility against Christians. But otherwise, when you speak to a Hindu, okay, you say he's God, fine, one more. They'll accept, you know, whatever. It's not like they're going to openly say no. Or oh, it's okay, you have him, I have this, I have this, I have this. You know. So, um, uh, but the Bible is presenting Jesus as the only provision for salvation. Life's purpose, it's to know God, come into a personal relationship with God, and to live a life that does the will of God. Here, if you try to sum it up in simple ways, I'm not saying it's just this, but in simple ways, uh, for the, uh, in the Hindu belief, the purpose is that you should have good karma. Right? You should have more good works than bad works. So that is okay. As long as you have good karma, then you know maybe you will have salvation and so on. Heaven. Uh, it's a place of joy, uh, it's a place to be with Jesus. In Hinduism, it's experiencing moksha, salvation, and nirvana, becoming one with God. So heaven is like, that's the ultimate, you become one with God. And uh, so salvation, moksha, is understood as a liberation from the cycle of birth and rebirth, reincarnation. You escape it. You're not going to come back here again. So that is understood as salvation. And then you become one with Brahma, that's Nirvana. You're experiencing oneness with God. Right? Hell, uh, Bible is telling us very clearly that hell is a place where we are separated from God forever. No chance after that. But here in Hinduism, the belief is there is no actual place called hell, but the fact that you are trapped in the cycle of birth and death and birth and death, this whole cycle, that itself is hell. Understood as hell. As long as you don't have enough good karma, you will not experience moksha, you will not come out of this cycle of reincarnation. So, these are some beliefs. So, here we have to be careful. Suppose you say Trinity. We believe in Triune God. The Hindus, we also have Trinity. No? Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva. So, full confusion will come. When we start saying God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, they are thinking like this. When you say you have to be born again, you're also born again. <laughs> but we are meaning something different. When we say born again, we are saying you will receive life from God now. Born again here is reincarnation. Ah, you come back again into this world. Second time, third time, many times. So we have to be careful when we are uh, talking about, uh, when we are using these terms. 
and you're talking to a Hindu, right? So we have to, it is better to avoid using these kinds of terms because you have to explain the term, you have to explain the difference, but that is not the goal. They, that we can do later, right? Right now, we want them to understand about faith in Jesus, why Jesus is different. What did Jesus do on the cross? Right? And so, the inf so when we, again, when we talk about sin, we have to realize they are thinking in terms of good and bad karma, good and bad deeds. So the emphasis is to be, first of all, to help them understand the consequence of sin, the seriousness. It's not like, oh, I told a lie, I'll tell two good things, finish. No, it's not as simple as that, right? Go God is a holy God, and our sin has consequences, right? The other second thing is, how can sin be atoned for? In the mind of the Hindu, or in the Hindu belief, it is, if I do a lot of good things, if I, you know, uh, go on pilgrimages, if I dip in the holy rivers, if I give a lot of offering, I do a lot of good things, I can compensate for my bad, true works. So that is another second area where we have to purposely address, intentionally address, right? That uh, our good deeds cannot compensate for our bad deeds. Okay? So using examples, we help them think. right? And then we have to think about how God is reaching down to us as opposed to how we are trying to reach God. So in the Hindu belief, the focus is on you trying to reach God through various ways. Huh? You live a good life, you do meditation, you do penance, uh, you live a very ascetic life, all those things, you get enlightenment, you're trying to reach God. Big difference. In the Christian faith, God is reaching to us, coming to us. And God is dealing with our sin problem rather than we trying to deal with our own sin problem. So we have to make these things. And this, this is the gospel. Basically, it's the gospel. You're making it very simple and you're, you're contrasting it to their belief. So they understand the difference. Right? Why uh, it is so different. Otherwise, if we don't explain this, they'll, Jesus, yeah, one more God, I'll take. I'll give my, will you give me Bible, I'll keep it in the house. I'll put one picture of Jesus. Again, five, six, six pictures will be there. But we can't say they are saved. Just because they take picture of Jesus and put it in the house, we can't say they are saved. Or they take your take the Bible, keep it. We can't say they are saved because they have not understood the difference, right? So we have to uh, think about these things. So other things we uh, you know we may or may, we may run into. Uh, page seventy nine is the caste system, you know. Uh, be aware of it, but that does but that doesn't have to be a main point in sharing the gospel. You know, that we can deal with later, right? But we are aware of it. Uh, that will slowly come, that God sees all of us equal, you know, in Jesus. doesn't matter where we were born or our social standing, all that. But that will deal later. But keep that in mind. Reincarnation, we spoke about. Yoga, uh, it basically means discipline uh, or right spiritual exercise. So understand that... Uh, even though there is physical exercise, actually is a spiritual thing, has a spiritual root to it, right? So, uh, karma, we spoke about uh, your dharma, which is the goodness, righteousness, avatars, or human forms, uh, and so on, right? So, in Hinduism, again, uh, the concept of avatars. So, when we say incarnation, they are thinking in terms of avatars. Oh. Our God also came many times, right? 
So in a very gentle way, in a very nice way, we have to emphasize the difference. That God who became man in the Christian faith, Jesus Christ, he was without sin. He did not do any evil. Whereas in, you know, without, we don't have to necessarily state it, but uh, they will recognize that in the Hindu belief, even some of the avatars, they did sin also. So very, it's different. So if this is really God, God who became man, he was without sin. And he came only once. He finished the work and he went back. So this is the difference between the incarnation in the Bible and the uh, I, concept of avatars in the Hindu faith. Okay. So when we are sharing the gospel, like we were saying, some of the things we have to emphasize. Okay. Sin and evil. Right? What is sin? It is not just you did a bad deed, but what does the Bible say about sin? and uh, the existence of evil and uh, drawing the difference between the Bible's consequences of sin versus what the Hindu belief of karma and reincarnation, you know, draw the difference. Next is forgiveness. You know, how God is reaching to man and there can be salvation given as a gift. Instead of the Hindu belief that you have to try to reach God and you have to try to do good works in order to reach God. Right? This one complete sacrifice. Jesus took our sin. He bore our sin. And uh, we are saved. Right? And we can also say, you know, it is almost impossible. If you see, sit down and think of it, it's almost impossible to have, uh, you know, more good works. Because by nature, we are always, we are sinful. We say and do, even if we think wrong thoughts, think wrong thoughts, say wrong words, you know, we are doing so many wrong things. So it's almost impossible to have this uh, positive karma or good karma because of our inclination to sin. And then lovingly contrast Christ with many avatars, right? That Christ was unique, sinless, perfect, finished the work, one incarnation, done. And very important, God is seeking a personal relationship with us now. It's a free gift. He wants to make you his son or daughter now. You know, not uh, left to a chance where through many cycles of reincarnation you might become a child of God. Or, I mean, be joined with God. Who knows? But the Bible is very clear. Through faith in Jesus, now you can become a child of God. And also... In the Christian faith, it is God who changes our lives, as opposed to you trying to change your own life. You know, he makes us a new creation. He gives us the power to live a godly life, as opposed to you know all the self-discipline, self-realization, things that you do for yourself. Right? So these are the main points of difference that you lovingly share when you're sharing the gospel with a Hindu. And then, of course, we are going to depend on the Holy Spirit to open their hearts and minds. Is that clear? Yeah? So if we share this, then they'll clearly understand the difference. You know, why is faith in Jesus different from the Hindu belief? You know, uh, What are the main points? Don't get to too much doctrine. Trinity, and born again, they'll get confused. So avoid those terms. That they will learn later. Keep it simple. Main points. Okay. How you can have faith in Jesus. Okay. So, any questions? Yes. Um, 
when we are conversing with a hindu no in specific what is a good starting point to initiate the conversation to ask one is it like uh, what is it that you believe or to ask on the other side like have you heard about jesus christ have you been to a church mm -hmm. what would be a good starting point yeah uh so uh, how do we start a conversation with a hindu uh, again it all depends on the relationship you know we share with that person but let's say you know suppose it's just a stranger you're sitting around you're chit chatting chit chatting let's say you know you, you're sitting in a restaurant you happen to meet this person a total stranger but you started a conversation uh you're just you know how are you what are you doing this that you know then in the process uh depending on the conversation so example oh, where did you study oh, I said, then they said i studied them in convent school christian school sometimes you know i study like that oh so while you were in the christian school did they, did anybody at any time tell you about the gospel so you're using their own background and asking you know did you hear the gospel any time they'll say what is the gospel then you say okay i will quickly explain you know so like that based on the conversation or uh suppose you're just chatting and then you know you say see there's so much they start, start you start talking about the war see so much so much fighting Israel is fighting with all the other countries and uh, then uh, Russia and Ukraine and you're just talking general politics here what is happening and then the conversation goes on you know uh, yeah so people are suffering so much yeah so I wonder you know you, you're purposely directing the conversation to, to bring to them to a point where you may have a chance to share the gospel hopefully you know you have time there's no pressure then it's gonna be, you know have you i wonder why there is so much evil suffering in the world so we've gone from talking politics now to philosophy from there you go into gospel yeah. so i wonder why there is so much on if it's somebody you have a good friendship with relation then you can directly start like you know hey Ah, so I think it's better to it, uh, my usual approach. If it's a friendship, right? We know the person. Hey, w w is it okay if I take you know about ten minutes and share the gospel, share the message of Jesus with you? And because of the friendship, because you all know, I say, oh, okay, okay. Tell me what it is. So that, that's direct. And rather, see, the thing is, the moment we say, tell me what you believe, what happens is, not only will he tell you what you believe, he'll also be thinking how to defend that. So you're putting him on a defensive place. Uh, but whereas if we say, is it okay if I share the gospel with you or the, or the message of Jesus with you, then we are putting him into a receptive place. That means you just receive what I'm saying. Yeah. So after we share the message of Jesus, and in that, while we are sharing the message of Jesus, we make all these distinctions very clear. You know, Because we know in our minds, this is what they think, this is what they believe. So when we bring the message of Jesus, we hit on all these points. Hey, you know, sin is like this. Uh, you know, it's not just doing some bad deeds. This is the consequence of sin. And then we can't reach God. We can't deal with sin ourselves. But the Bible is so tells us God is so good. He reaches down to us. And He's giving, and Jesus paid the price. And He's giving salvation for us as a gift, you know. And forgiveness of sins, and now we can become a child of God. We can become one with God in His family, and now He will change. You know, He starts working in our lives. So all these are points of distinction, which we are communicating. Then immediately seeing all the difference. Then, of course, last we say, okay, you know, would you like to make a decision? You know, and learn more about Jesus. I want to follow Jesus, or would you like to receive this gift of salvation? I lead you in a simple prayer, and then from there it starts. Yeah. Pastor, uh, in Hindu, like we used to call God as a Bhagwan. So when we used to read Hindi Bible, the Bhagwan word is not there, and when we are singing songs, worship songs, so we are not using Bhagwan word. So, I, what's the Oh, so usually in the Hindi Bible it says Khuda, Parmeshwar or Ish, Ishwar. Ishwar. Okay.
Yeah, I think it's uh, so. I, 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 about Hindi language, now I don't know too much, but I, I think yeah, in order to avoid confusion, maybe is that's the reason why in the Hindi Bible they use Parmeshwar or Ishwar. Uh, maybe to avoid the confusion. Yeah. So I, I I think that's and 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 if that's the reason, then that's a good reason, a valid reason, right? Because uh, we don't want people to get confused, right? That uh, if we also use the same term, then they may think we are calling upon the same God. But when we use a distinct, different term, then they understand. Oh, this is. I mean, I, I don't know the actual reasons, but I'm just guessing that this could be the reason. Pastor, I have a question. Yes, please. Uh, this Hindu belief, they have this uh, Brahman. Uh, does he also ceases to be God sometime? Sorry. Uh, 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 yeah, in Hindu, Brahman, Brahma, Brahma yeah. is their God and they enter into Brahman for some time and they are like uh, experience that godliness. But does Brahman also ceases to be God sometimes and it takes another reincarnation? No, no. So, uh, so let's say Brahma, Shiva, Vishnu, and the other 300 million gods and goddesses, the names that they have, they are not gods, right? They're not God or gods, right? So we don't confuse them with the true and living God. Uh, so we, Brahma is not the true and living God. We don't confuse the two. Uh, there are many titles, names, but none of them are the true and living God. God. Is that okay? Okay, okay. Thank you, Pastor. Yeah. Uh, it's about Jesus. Like sometimes people used to ask, they know scripture very well. So they will say, How can you believe like the Messiah has to come is the Jesus? Because they will see the math in Matthew, the angel said, The man, the child will be born, you will keep uh, his name Emmanuel. Mm. So they will ask, how can you believe like Jesus, the Messiah is the Jesus? Because they didn't see the name, the Emmanuel in the uh, gospel they called. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, so um, so Matthew 121, it clearly says his name will be called Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. Whereas uh, Isaiah writes, his name will be called uh, 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 sorry, a wonderful counselor, mighty God, the Prince of Peace, and I forget where's Emmanuel now. Um, I think it's Matthew. Uh, so they are, they're saying, okay, this, G, this Jesus who was born, he was not given the name Emmanuel, or what is it? Or, uh, Matthew 1. 21, she bring for the son, call his name Jesus. Verse 23, the virgin shall be called better son. They shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. That's Isaiah 7, 14, right? So we can explain it like this. Uh, his name was Jesus from Nazareth. Christ, Emmanuel, Son of God, Son of Man, all the other other thing, other names are titles of the same person, right? So is is okay. His name is Jesus. His name given name was Jesus. So that's why they refer to him as Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus, you came from Nazareth. Nazareth was the place, his town from where he, where he grew up. So the, the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Christ is 
title. It's a title means he's the Messiah. Christ simply means Messiah. So Jesus, the Messiah. They recognized him as the Messiah. So Christ, Emmanuel, is also a title. So we have to explain to them. See, his name was, given name was Jesus. But he had many titles. We call him with, by many titles. Emmanuel, Messiah, Son of God, Son of Man, Good Shepherd. Huh? All these are titles given to Jesus. But referring to the same person. Example, we'll say, Prime Minister. That's a title. But his name is Modi. But we can refer to the same person by saying Prime Minister. If I say Prime Minister, you know who you're talking about? Modi, right now. If I say Modi, the same person. So we can refer to the same person by the name or by the titles. Okay? So that's how it is. We so explain to them. And Jesus, many titles. Prince of Peace. Title. All right. Any other questions? Fine. Brother? Uh, yes, please. Go ahead. Brother, how do we defend ourselves when people tell us that as a foreign religion which we have acknowledged? Mm -hmm. And. Um, we I mean that is a uh, uh, that uh, we have been converted into Christianity. Mm -hmm. As earlier in earlier days, they used to give money and other things they have they used to do. Mm. Uh, they see us in that way itself. True. Yeah. Uh, it is true, um, in the sense that uh, Jesus was not Indian; he was <laughs> born in the Middle East. And so it is true that uh, in that sense, yeah, it is a, a belief or a faith or a religion that has come from outside India. It's not native to India. So, uh, that is true. Uh, but I think uh, we explain it like this. See, God had to start, like God, in God had to, God's desire, God's plan was to reach the whole world, for God so loved the world. But in order to reach the world, he had to use somebody, some group of people. If he had used Indians, example, Chinese will say, ah, that's a foreign religion, why it came from India. Or others will say the same thing. But he had to use somebody. And God, in His wisdom, He chose the people over there. Starting with Abraham in the land of Israel, He chose them. We call them the Jews or the Israel, Israelites. He chose them. And He decided that through them, He will reach the whole world. The Bible is very clear. God so loved the world. He did not say He only loved the Jews. For God so loved the world that He sent His Son, Jesus. So we could reason like that. See, God had to work with some people, somebody, some, some group of people, and He chose to work with the Jews. If He had chosen to work with some other group, our question would still be the same. Why He chose them, why not us? He had to choose somebody, He chose them. Be happy. But the Bible is very clear. The gospel is for everybody. Salvation is for everybody. And God does not differentiate uh, based on our race and so on. We are all welcome into the faith. So we could explain it like that. I think any reasonable person would be willing to understand that. Uh, you know, uh, And uh, the fact is, the, uh, the same people who say, oh, Christianity is a foreign religion, they'll still go and eat in McDonald's, KFC. Uh, drink Coca-Cola. I mean, you know, they're open to all these foreign things, right? Uh, these are all brands that have come from outside. But in our day-to-day -day lives, generally, people embrace it. Uh, they welcome it. They don't say, oh, this car was made by Americans. I won't buy it. No. Yes. You know, they embrace it a lot. 
So just a simple reasoning explanation should help. Okay. It is faster. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, the term what they use converted, it is uh, very disturbing to take that word into our mind. At that time, what we we do to overcome that type of thing. Yeah. Um, see, the word conversion, uh, one is the, you know, the word converted is in the Bible. It's a biblical term. I mean, there, it's in the Bible, but it is used in different ways. You know, so for example, Acts 3, I think, Acts 3, 19, it talks about, uh, let me just make sure I'm giving the right verse, Acts 3, that we should be converted, Acts 3. Um, sorry, Acts 3, 19, yeah. So, repent, therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out. Acts 3.19. So, the word converted uh, is in the Bible. It's a biblical term. And it is part of that whole process of turning to God. You now, repent and be converted, so that your sins may be blotted out. So, that is how the Bible is using it. It's a good term. That means... I'm having a change of mind, I'm having a change of heart, and I am turning to God. That's the way the Bible is using it. But the way the you know general public and politicians and those things, the, when we say anti-conversion, uh, it is used in a very negative way. Like you were saying, it's used in a negative way. They feel like we have been cheated or we have been deceived or uh, sometimes we've been bribed or whatever, you know. Uh, but the fact is this, we know that true conversion, the way the Bible talks about it, only can happen through the power of the Word of God and through the power of the Holy Spirit. I, I can't go and force somebody to convert. True conversion, that means a change of heart and mind, only happens because of the power of the Gospel and the power of the Holy Spirit. That is something not man cannot manufacture. Okay? The Holy Spirit works, and then there's a change of heart. There's a change of understanding. There's a change of belief. That's conversion. That is Bible, the conversion that comes from God. And so we stay with that. We, say we know what the true conversion is, but the way they are using it is wrong. They think everybody is bribed or everybody is deceived, but it's not true. It's not true. The reason a person, whatever background they are from, would make a decision to follow Jesus is because they have experienced true conversion, which is something God has done in their hearts and opened their minds, and they've decided to follow Jesus. It's, it's, a, it's a very positive thing, and it's something God does. And then they make the choice to follow Jesus, right? Yes, brother. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. No so just a follow-up question in the same line. Uh, so is it good when they talk about religion and thing? I, I would uh, straight away tell them that you know our God is not interested in the religion. He's more interested in the relationship. Correct. One. And can you use James one twenty seven, which says, uh, "Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this: to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world." So can we try to bring this and take? their mind out of the concept of you know moving from one religion to another religion that is not what god is interested in, but he's more interested in a relationship with you mm. so yeah so it's the first part when we say god is not interested in religion but he's interested in relationship that's a good thing to say right and we could also say like relig religion is man's effort to reach god i mean the way they understand whereas what the Bible is talking about relationship is God reaching to us, right? Now, uh, we can bring James 1.27 at a later point. When we talk, after they become believers, and after they, uh, when we are trying to teach them on how to live the Christian life, we can bring it then. 
but we shouldn't bring James 127 at the beginning when we are sharing the gospel because then they will say, ah, that even I'm doing. I'm already doing. I'm visiting orphans. I'm giving food to the poor. I'm, I'm only doing what you're talking about. No, no, no. For us, first relationship, then we do all these things out of that relationship. You know, so bring this in later. Like, yeah, yeah. We have to live a good life and uh, bless people and care for them. Bring it later. But salvation comes purely because God reaches out to us. Yeah. So. yeah. Good. So let's uh, now just take some time to... Well, it's already 9.40. At least let's do how much we can. So when we want to talk about sharing Christ with a Muslim, actually this is a little bit more difficult. Because here, we, one is, uh, especially in reaching Muslims, we have to depend on God to open up their understanding, okay, for them to have an encounter with Jesus. Okay? Of course, we share the gospel, right? But let us understand, you know, the differences, the distinctions, right? And how to share the gospel. But really, we have to depend on the Holy Spirit to uh, work in their hearts. Because, uh, again, within Muslims, we need to understand there are the fundamental Muslims, and then there are the more like modern, contemporary Muslims. The fundamental Muslims are people who have been really uh, indoctrinated in the in the mosques and all that. They 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 told very you know, very strictly, how to challenge the Christian faith. There are the, and then there are the more modern, contemporary Muslims. They, they are very open, because they are actually, actually very fed up with what they have seen happen in the Muslim world, the Arab world. The fighting, the destruction, the oppression, uh, the injustice, Right? So you have those kinds of Muslims. Right? They are more contemporary. Contemporary. They are more. You would say that they are non-practicing Muslim. They are Muslim by name, but they are not practicing. And they are now. They are op They are open. They are like, hey, what are our people doing? You know. And they look at some of the Arab nations. So they are more open. But then there are also a lot. Majority would be strictly conservative, fundamental majority. But then there are also these things. So when we. Um, uh, make friendship, begin conversation. We need to understand there are both categories. Right? There are some who are very open. They've, they've, they've seen what has happened in the Arab world, and so they are kind of uh, disillusioned with it. And they're very open to receiving the gospel. But there is the fundamental. All right. Now, the belief systems. Let's, maybe we can cover that, and then we'll stop. So there is... God, when you talk about God, we are again talking about one true God, God in three persons. For them in Islam, Allah is one God. And the moment they hear God in three persons, it's a stumbling block. For them, it's strictly one person. So you, when we say triune God, God the Father, God the Son, God, they, oh, you, you cannot. It's very hard for them to understand. So, don't bring that concept in at the beginning. Because then that itself becomes a stumbling block. They you have to try to explain Trinity. Very difficult for them to understand. So, just refer to as God. Okay, they understand the term God. Great reverence for God. They understand. Man. We say man is sinful. They think man is basically good. And they look at sin in a very different, <laughs> different way. The thing is this. When we talk about sin and forgiveness uh, in Islam, sin and forgiveness, forgiveness is something that Allah does based on His choice. It's not a guaranteed thing. You know, as a Muslim, you try to follow very strict laws and rules. 
but you cannot have the assurance of being forgiven. Whereas in the Bible, we say, the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, has cleansed me from every sin. I have the assurance. I know I am forgiven. In Islam, it's up to Allah. You ask, Allah will decide. Okay. So the concept of sin and forgiveness is... Sin is there, but forgiveness is slightly different. It's up to Allah to decide. So you're not sure, are you forgiven or not? Right? So when we talk to a Muslim and you ask, you know, do you know if your sins are forgiven? Allah decides, yeah, up to Allah. So the assurance is not there. But I'm do, I'll do my best, you know, I'll go do my prayers, I'll do my namaz, I'll go on my pilgrimage, I'll do all those things, but I don't have the assurance. Scripture, we have the Bible, they have the Quran, uh, Jesus Christ, we know he's only a provision for salvation. So Islam, they see him as a prophet, but not as a son of God. Again, if you use the term son of God, very difficult. Difficult to understand. So we will we'll discuss these things, okay? So we have to be careful when you're talking to a Muslim. Don't try to say son of God, son of man. All of you get very confused, right? So those things can come later. We'll ex we can explain those titles later, right? But when we, we have to deal with the main issue of salvation, of knowing God, right? We can explain. Of course, we can explain Son of God, Son of Man, but let do it, let's do it later. Life's purpose is to have a personal relationship with God uh, as in the Christian faith. There it is to submit to Allah. So here again, Allah is seen as a, as a very far away God, as a very uh, as as ruler, somebody you have to submit to. Don't ask any questions. Whereas in the Bible, God is a loving Father. Yes, God is Judge. God is all powerful, but God is a loving Father. That concept is not there in Islam. In Islam, God is somebody far away. You have to just obey. So that's that. That sense of submission is big. All right. So basically, the name Muslim, one who submits to Allah, submission to. Allah. Don't ask. Just submit. Submit. So that's a very big thing. That's why uh, uh, the whole thing of uh, you know being free to worship God, uh, free to make your choice. That's big contrast between uh, being a Muslim and following God, you know. Heaven, uh, it's a place of joy and we receive it as God's gift. Uh, Islam, if Allah decides, so no assurance. Hell is a place of torment. Uh, Islam for those who have rejected Allah and those who are rejected by Allah. So if you reject Allah and you He's rejected you, hell. Okay. All right. So let's stop here. We'll pick this up next Sunday. Uh, next week, <laughs> Sunday. <laughs> so have it. <laughs> uh, we'll pick this up next week. Uh, continue this. Just to understand how to share Jesus. Okay, let's pause here. We'll continue this. Wait, we have one more class, right?